Good afternoon and welcome to the very first webinar for the IMF. My name is John Burgess and I am the Chairman of the Marketing and Membership Committee. The IMF is looking to present regular webinars based on all aspects of the IMF and going forward we would welcome any suggestions that may be of benefit to you. For today's webinar I am very pleased to welcome Fisher Instruments who will be presenting coating thickness measurements with electromagnetic methods. I'd first like to say that I have rehearsed what most of the buttons do with regards to our webinar, but please bear with me if there is a hiccup. I'll now hand you over to Fisher Instruments for the Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kenan Hanzik, and I am the Business Development Manager for Fisher Instrumentation. Um, so today, I've been kindly invited by John to talk to you about some of the coating thickness measurements with uh, electromagnetic methods. So today, what we have in the agenda is the current, in, currently used uh, methods for measuring coating thicknesses. Um, the factors affecting uh, electromagnetic thickness measurements, so this may be the shape of an object or the coating composition, for example, possible operator errors, etc. And then I will briefly touch on the other forms of measurement uh, that we have in our range. So these may be X-ray fluorescence, coulometrics or ultrasonics. Um, and finally, the take-home message is um, how, how we can eliminate most of the errors that we see when taking measurements. So first and foremost, the two most commonly known uh, methods to measure coating thicknesses um, are the magnetic induction method and the eddy current method. Now, both, uh, both of these methods uh, are widely used in many, many different gauges. Uh, however, they work slightly differently. Um, so the magnetic induction method obviously uses the steel or iron substrates which are able to, using, using the substrates they are able to create a magnetic field which is, this, uh, which is displaced slightly when there's a, there's a coating uh, on top of the surface. Now this displacement uh, of the magnetic field then is, um, it is converted to a thickness value which obviously is the thickness of the material itself. Um, similarly, with the eddy current method, again, a, um, a magnetic field is generated or an electro, uh, electrical field is generated, uh, which generates uh, eddy currents within the substrate or within the coating as well. Um, now, based on the displacement of that field, uh, what, what we can then calculate is basically the thickness of the material itself. Now, the two main differences between these uh, methods themselves is really the, the, the range at which they work. So for the magnetic induction method, um, it's really looking at the hertz to low kilohertz range, whereas the eddy currents, the uh, eddy current method, they require kilohertz to several megahertz range. Um, now, this higher frequency obviously is required to um, generate these um, eddy currents within, within a material. So, first and foremost, the uh, magnetic induction method. Uh, so, the way our probes are designed is that there is a excitation current and a measurement signal. Uh, so, there's two coils around the probe. Um, and the sort of the sort of uh, displacement of the magnetic field then is um, is translated by the measurement signal, uh, or sorry, is translated to a coating thickness uh, as a result of the measurement signal that is uh, that is given off. So main field uh, main fields of application would uh, be non-ferromagnetic material on ferromagnetic substrates. Um, 
for electroplated coatings, for example, uh, chrome, zinc, copper, or aluminium on steel or iron, or indeed paint, enamel, or varnish, uh, or plastic coatings on steel and iron. So really, the main industries that we are looking at uh, targeting with this sort of um, device would be sort of the electroplaters, uh, automotive industry, uh, both obviously um, tier one, two, and three suppliers, uh, paint manufacturers, um, construction industry itself, and even aerospace. But with the aerospace industry moving now towards uh, non-ferromagnetic uh, substrates, which are lighter, uh, sometimes more structurally uh, sound than, than iron itself or steel, uh, we are seeing less use of that and more uh, use with the eddy current methods. So the eddy current methods, um, the difference here is that there's only one coil around the, around the probe and it's used as the excitation and uh, detection uh, coil. So basically, uh, what, uh, what sort of fields of application we're looking at, it's really non-conducting layer material on electrically, non -ferrous, uh, electrically conducting non-ferrous metal. Um, it, we're looking at paint, varnish, plastics again uh, on non-ferrous metal or anodic films on aluminium, let's say. So what sort of industries we, we generally target with these uh, instruments is really PCB manufacture for uh, measuring, let's say, copper coatings on uh, isolating substrates. Uh, again, electroplaters can be targeted. Uh, aeronautic, aeronautics and automotive industry can, with their tier one to three suppliers, uh, paint manufacturers and uh, anybody who's doing anodizing for, let's say, um, for example, the QualiCode standard. Um, so, yeah, uh, there is a third method of um, of detection that we employ, and that is actually the phase sensitive eddy current. Now, this is a little bit different uh, than the normal eddy current. Uh, it uses two probes again, but the beautiful thing about this is that the eddy currents that it generates, uh, we're able to exploit these uh, in so that we can measure um, different metallized coatings, for example, zinc or copper or nickel on ferromagnetic steels, but also under paint. So we can actually uh, we can actually get a reading of the paint coating itself, um, the thickness of that uh, on top of the zinc or nickel or copper uh, on top of the on top of the substrate, which is either isolating material or steel. Um, so, now bear with me, this uh, is a little bit uh, tough to swallow, so anybody who doesn't have a good um, engineering background or, let's say, theoretical physics background or mathematics background, like myself, um, would probably struggle with this uh, a little bit. Um, but Believe me when I tell you, because a lot of uh, people who are much smarter than me have figured out that there is apparently an imaginary part and a real part um, to the way this, uh, this instrument is detecting the coating thickness. So what is happening here is uh, this is essentially an impedance diagram. And what it's, uh, what it's doing is basically when, you've, when you have zero, let's say, microns, when you have absolutely no coating on the, on the substrate, uh, what you're going to see is essentially the black line um, at the top of the, at the, top of the uh, presentation there. Um, what this means is basically that is, the, that is the point at which it, only the substrate is um, detected. Once you move, uh, once you increase, let's say, the coating thickness uh, of the zinc uh, on top of, let's say, the steel, um, at 4.3 microns, 
you can actually see that the red line has shifted slightly um, to to give a different reading along this uh, along this uh, this axis. Um, what this means is that as the as the as the thickness of the zinc increases, uh, these these lines are actually able, or these lines change in the in the in the in in the place where they're where they're plotted on the diagram. Um, and then what we can do is for each of these lines we can create uh, we can calculate a phase angle, as a, as as it's called, which is able to then be translated into a coating thickness. So I know I've probably uh, not explained that entirely uh, sufficiently, but um, if there is any questions afterwards regarding this, please uh, please direct them to us and I'd be happy to get somebody to, to explain it a little, in a little bit more detail. So the phase sensitive eddy current, well, what, uh, what sort of industries are we targeting? Um, we're, we're looking a lot into the fasteners uh, industry, so automotive or aerospace, where a lot of the, a lot of the parts are zinc plated. Um, the thing is that uh, the zinc on steel, for example, is very easy to, to detect, especially for, the, for this instrument, as you can get tiny probes which can actually measure on the fasteners themselves. Um, electroplating, obviously, uh, and galvanized parts uh, for what, uh, whatever component is, is actually being made. So whether that's, again, going into automotive or aerospace, or indeed um, structural industries as well. Uh, with this, in, uh, an interesting thing with this instrument is that we are actually able to detect um, thicknesses quite accurately, actually, of uh, thermally sprayed aluminium. So, for example, um, when, they're, when, let's say, oil derricks or uh, bridges or whatever the case may be, if when they're thermally coated, uh, when they're coated with thermally sprayed aluminium, basically the rough surface is non-uniform. Uh, it, it has inclusions or occlusions or various different uh, bits in the in the coating itself with which normally would re, um, result in a, a erroneous reading but with uh, the phase sensitive eddy current method this really isn't the case and i will touch upon that uh, in the next uh, couple of slides so as you can see there uh, rough surfaces uh, zinc surfaces really not a, not a big issue for this instrument at all. Um, so what are some of the factors that would affect the electromagnetic thickness measurements? Well, there is various factors um, that can falsify readings. The most important uh, factors are actually the shape of the specimen and the coating material that is used. Um, there is other uh, influencing factors such as roughness, indentation, or the practice of the operator, uh, which can affect it. But there's also external influences, such as, for example, temperature or the magnetic fields um, that are in the surrounding area. Um, now, I will talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. So, for example, um, the influence of the coating material itself is very important because if, uh, if, for example, there is iron oxide in, let's say, a coating material that has been put onto the steel or iron substrate, then it becomes a problem for magnetic induction to differentiate between the two layers. Um, obviously, the iron oxide in the coating is going to affect um, the, the readings themselves and possibly give the possibly give you a thicker reading than you you would normally expect. Uh, the same is true, for example, uh, for aluminium pieces in let's say paint, um, which is put onto non-ferrous metals. Again, this is a problem for eddy um, eddy current um, because obviously the interfaces between the aluminium pieces and the paint itself 
are going to uh, change the angle of the magnetic fields. Again, this is going to give you a false reading. So studies in uh, studies we've ca carried out in Germany have uh, have actually shown that if uh, if we are to look at a smooth surface and calibrate on it, when we use um, magnetic induction um, and look at, for example, the roughness of the uh, substrate, um, what we can see is actually that magnetic in induction sort of suffers from the, um, from the rough surface below. Um, I will go into more details about this, but what is actually apparent is that the eddy current methods suffer a lot more than the uh, magnetic induction. However, saying this, um, what I will sort of try to explain to you is that the phase sensitive eddy currents sort of don't suffer from this uh, from this method as a result of um, averaging uh, of the of the coating surface. And I will go into this a lot more. So influences of the roughness. Um, for the magnetic induction method, for example, uh, because the measurement is basically a magnetic field that's interacting with the sub, uh, substrate itself, the roughness of the substrate could potentially uh, have peaks which protrude out. Um, the probe that sits on top of the coating could then interact with these peaks and cause the reading to be smaller than it actually is. Um, for eddy current methods, the, the there is a possibility that eddy currents could actually be generated in the in the in the valleys or the or the or the peaks themselves or around the peaks uh, in the coating, which would again read to or lead to uh, different readings than than we would expect. So as I, as I alluded to it uh, in the previous slide, the phase sensitive eddy current method, what that does is if you can if you can see in the PSEC method uh, picture, you, you have sort of um, a red band within the coating material. So they are the eddy currents that are generated, but they do not essentially fall into into the pits or nor are they on uh, solely on top of the valleys so what happens here uh, is that the average let's say reading of the coating material is um, is taken and not just at local minima and maxima so i mean this uh, this sort of um, method is ideal for rough uh, substrates where for example um, you are coating, uh, in this case, brake pads or brake calipers um, with whatever the whatever the coating material is, zinc, for example. Um, so, what are the influences of shape? Well, every every probe that we have and every probe that anybody has ever developed is going to be influenced by the shape of the measurement area. So the minimum, there is always going to be a minimum area that is required for no influence at all. Um, so if a magnetic field reaches beyond the specimen, the magnetic fields are going to be um, allowed to turn more inwards uh, at, the, at the specimen air boundary, which can actually cause a thicker reading. Uh, then, then it's nominal. So, manual pl uh, placement of the of the probe becomes difficult then uh, to to get an accurate reading. Now, one of the take home messages from all of this, and I will uh, hopefully try to get you to to think about when when you are doing these measurements, is that most of these things can actually be uh, remedied by just a simple calibration on the substrate material. Um, so whatever the whatever the sample is, if you have a bare substrate or a bare sample uh, that you can calibrate on, most of these problems are actually going to be eliminated. Um, so the tip itself, for example, if there is a 
if there is significant wear on the tip, uh, the magnetic uh, induction method is actually going to be influenced quite a bit by uh, the tip wear because the tip itself is designed such that a, the electromagnetic waves are uh, propagated in a specific pattern, um, which allows us to, to get the correct readings. If there, is any, uh, if there is any wear in the tip, this is going to obviously influence these uh, electromagnetic waves. And then it's, it's actually going to give you false readings. Uh, with, the, with the eddy current method, the, there is very little um, effect of tip wear on the, on the actual readings themselves, as the tip is usually made out of a um, isolating material or is uh, a poor conductor for high frequency magnetic waves themselves. Um, measurement uh, probe placement, the tilting effect, is going to be a very important factor. Um, obviously, not everybody can put a probe down in the exact same spot at the exact same uh, angle that somebody else did. This is uh, one of the main areas of variation that arises uh, when different people are trying to do the same, uh, same types of measurements. Um, there is certain ways you can avoid this. So, for example, uh, by removing the human component of the measuring by, let's say, getting a measuring stand um, that which essentially automatically places the probe in the exact same orientation every time, a lot of the tilting effects uh, can actually be uh, avoided. Um, influences of indentation. So this is a particular, uh, particular feature of very soft coatings. Um, so what happens is that obviously with the magnetic induction method, if the coating is uh, pressed together, so if somebody is uh, measuring heavy handedly, uh, what tends to happen is that the, the coating is sort of squashed together, which alters the actual physical structure of the coating, which is then going to uh, be related as a different um, thickness value of the coating, um, thus making the probe, probe read in a different, uh, or a different value. Uh, with the eddy current method, what, uh, what tends to happen is that the eddy currents sort of pool within the, within the center of the, of the indent. Um, this is particularly prevalent if, uh, if you have a soft aluminium substrate with a coating on top of it, and somebody's being heavy handed, um, they can actually indent the aluminium and the coating, which then causes the uh, eddy currents to sort of pull to the to the bottom of the of the pit. Again, this falsifies the readings. Um, you can see here um, in in the left hand picture, for example, when the when the probe or the instrument was calibrated on a surface where there wasn't an indentation. Um, and then the, in the indented portion in the right picture was measured. What we, what we can show is that there's approximately six micron uh, difference in the depth of the, uh, between the, the lowest point within the, in the indentation and the actual uh, highest point of the, of the coating. Um, the apparent coating uh, thickness difference then reads as 20 microns, which is quite a substantial, uh, quite a substantial uh, difference between the two. So it can definitely mean be uh, mean a fail or uh, pass or fail in in a, in a critical component. Um, one of the major um, in fact or uh, influences is curvature. So. A lot of uh, a lot of a lot of um, let's say measuring methods can be influenced by 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 the shape of the of the of the object itself. In particular, curvature has uh, has notorious effects on um, on any of the probes that uh, that we see. But saying that, if we look at um, if we look at a for example non-ferrous metal. 
uh, which has a foil of 25 microns known thickness uh, measured on a flat surface. That same foil, which is 25 microns on a curved surface on non-ferrous metal, again, we are talking um, eddy currents here, would actually be closer to about 60 microns in, uh, in thickness. Because again, the interface between the metal itself and the air has changed uh, compared to the flat surface. Now, some very smart individuals in Fisher realized this and said, well, how could we actually compensate for this? So what we have actually done is we've made a probe which is able to be calibrated on the flat surface. So where the foil is 25 microns thick, and once you bring this foil to the uh, curved surface, what happens is that the internal workings of the probe actually compensate for the, uh, for the curvature and still report that the um, foil is close to its nominal value, 25 microns. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a probe with the magnetic induction method that does this. But a probe for the eddy current is available, and it is the FTD 3.3 probe here. So what does this uh, what does this sort of mean? Well, if you look at the top left picture, um, if we calibrate on location one, which is a flat surface, um, with the FTA and the FTD 3.3 probes, um, we can see that the nominal value is around nine or nine nine to ten microns when we move the probe to measure uh, the anodizing on uh, locations two three and four what we can see is that the different curvatures actually have different effects on the on the uh, fta 3.3 probe and its readings so for example in uh, the location two we've, we've we're, we're actually seeing 52.1 microns location three at 22 microns and location four at 62 microns, which is not the, uh, the value that we would expect. With the FTD probe, even though we've calibrated on the flat surface, we still maintain a relatively stable uh, value or thickness, around about 10 microns for each of the locations. Um, so finally, I mean, it's great that we have handheld instruments which are able to test all of these uh, all of these coatings um, very quickly, but sometimes it's not that simple. And really, what we're saying here is, although it's not an necessarily uh, an electromagnetic method such as magnetic induction or eddy currents, what we do have actually is X-ray analysis as well, which is a lot more powerful, I would say, than uh, than current handheld methods, um, which gives us more uh, more detailed information. So, for example, we're not only able to uh, figure out the material composition, but we are also able to do um, coating thickness readings on up to five different coatings. But it does come with a caveat: um, X-ray fluorescence, as you probably know it only measures uh, more or less metallic uh, components. So any elements from sodium up to uranium can be measured and no or organic component can actually be measured. Now I do say sodium uh, and I have it highlighted in red there uh, purely because for, for us to measure sodium uh, we would need the most accurate detectors but not only that, we would probably have to uh, employ the use of a helium flush system, which eliminates all the air around the, around the detector, uh, replacing it with helium, or a vacuum uh, system, which completely removes the air. Um, that way we can get down to these lower elements, which uh, tend to sort of be soaked up or, um, let's say, um, prevented from reaching the, the detector by the air. Um, the, another method, for example, is uh, 
beta backscatter. Now, this uses a radioactive source to actually um, probe the thickness of coatings. And there is, a, there is a requirement that the substrate and the coating have to be approximately five atomic masses different um, be, before a, uh, a reading can actually be uh, acquired. But saying that, uh, we have actually seen a lot of use in, for example, the oil films industry. So if there is a film uh, lub uh, lubricant, let's say, being put onto a specific part, this method is actually able to, to, to measure it. Um, in, indeed, we've also seen it in plastics. And also, if, you, if you're putting, let's say, um, primers or glues onto, onto windshields, we're also able to detect thickness of these things. So it isn't necessarily uh, limited to having a ferrous or non-ferrous metal as its base, as it can pretty much do anything, really. Um, we also have the essentially the reverse plating method, the coulometric method, um, which essentially creates a current between a, uh, a probe and the, the substrate layer at, um, on which the coating sits. And basically, it reverse electroplates the, um, the coating on, on the substrate. What that means is that we can actually very accurately calculate what the coating thickness is purely by doing the reverse plating. Um, finally, uh, Fisher have actually come up with uh, come out with a ultrasonic um, method now. Now this uses a some ultrasonic uh, sound waves basically to measure the interfaces between, let's say, coatings and substrates. Now bear in mind this only works if a coating is above, say, 150 microns. But where th this is seen particular. Um, use is, for example, measuring coating, uh, measuring the actual wall thicknesses, for example, on pipelines to check for corrosion or on brake calipers to check that they're, they're the correct size and ensure that the dimensions are what the specification um, calls them to be. Um, I believe that's it for me, uh, except for the ta take home message. So again, where possible, uh, perform a calibration on uncoated material. This will sort of eliminate most of the problems that uh, people, people encounter within, when, when trying to measure coatings. The base should really have the same shape, roughness, and material properties as the coated or finished article. Um, if that is still uh, causing errors, well then, there is a possibility that the operator is could potentially be a problem. Um, in this case, what you can do is use a curvature compensated probe if curvature is, a, is an issue, or you could use a stand to completely remove the human factor from the measurements and get repeatable results. Alternatively, what you can do is you can try a completely different method and see if that corroborates the answers that you've been getting with the uh, electromagnetic methods. Um, this is uh, our Fisher range uh, of thickness gauges. So we have MPO and the FMP range, which are our bread and butter, basically. The Faceco paint the PM, uh, is our new um, sort of baby. It allows us to basically have a mobile probe which um, pairs up nicely with your phone so we have an app on our uh, that you can download for your phone and connect a um, a coating thickness instrument to it um, the facecope pmp10 and the facecope duplex are from the same family and they employ the face sensitive eddy current methods which are good for metal on metal basically uh, we have conductivity, uh, we are able to do conductivity measurements using the sigmascope, and that's usually for non-ferrous materials. Um, 
and again this is this is this could be used for example for metal sorting um, we can test the anodizing sealing quality with the anode test we can do the reverse plating method with the cooloscope and we also have the ultrasonic gauges with in our UMP range um, that's pretty much it for me uh, if there's any questions please uh, please direct them now thank you very much Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to open up the chat question and answer. So if you want to um, put some questions forward, we'll take them um, and see how we get on with that. So um, the first one I have is how will handheld instruments cope with the aerospace switch from cadmium to zinc nickel? That's a good question. Um, recently, we have actually seen uh, quite an increase in, uh, in in the aerospace sector particularly uh, wanting to measure zinc nickel rather than cad cadmium it's true um, to date i think we do have one probe which is able to measure it uh, adequately uh, we are currently working on a surefire solution um, and that is sort of as much as I can say uh, at this at this moment um, but I, I would I would urge you to stay tuned because we will have some things that will come out um, hopefully pretty shortly which are able to do the job adequately any other questions I hope that answers the question though. oh yes somebody is typing I can see just to let you know, we have recorded this. Um, so one of my next challenges is to get the recording into a form that you will be able to log into and see. So if you want to watch it again, um, you can do. Um, immediately, I found out how to do that. Another bit of the interesting part of it, I will let you know. And if you want to get the um, recording down just to have another look, that is absolutely fine. Um, yes, I still not got any more yes there's somebody else typing it's separate yes. typing but i'm not seeing a message at the moment i have a question here any news on handheld xrf um, um we, we do, do have, have a handheld uh, xrf instrument uh in our range uh yes it's available however i will uh i will say that um if people are going to be using handheld xrf they really need to uh, consult the IRR 17. Um, basically, the NHS requires anybody who's using XRF equipment to put in place certain guidelines uh, which will maintain the safety of the operators of the XRF instrumentation. Um, they require, obviously, somebody to be appointed as a, a radiation protection officer. And to do that, you would really need to register and uh, see talk to a radiation protection advisor about that. Um, we do have, like I said, a handheld XRF instrument, which is very capable. Um, and currently, we also have a chamber for it. Um, basically, it sort of it sort of allows you to use the instrument both as a handheld instrument for extremely large parts and also allows you the benefit of having a chamber to store a chain without the risk of any radiation uh, leakage, etc. Uh, would I advise on thin anodized coatings, three to five microns? Um, okay. Uh, generally, what I would advise to my customers uh, is the FMP100 with the FTD 3.3 probe. Now, I know that uh, not many people, uh, not everybody needs a curvature compensated probe, but for that one time that you actually do need it, it actually does come in very handy because it sort of, um, it sort of eliminates the, the need for you to calibrate or, or to have different applications calibrated on different points. Um, for example, in that anodized part that I showed in the in one of the slides, there was four different points. One of them being flat three with different um, curvatures. 
So that would be my suggestion. Why the FMD100? Well, it is a remarkably uh, versatile instrument. Um, what it does uh, really well is it does all the statistics, all the reporting uh, on the instrument itself. So when you're um, when you're on the shop floor, you can actually even um, put up SPC, uh, SPC charts and um, do a sort of a report on the instrument, which uh, which you don't really have to uh, move to the to the laptop or computer to generate these reports. How often should you ch uh, change a probe if it uh, becomes worn? Surely after one use, it's worn. Um, that is a good question. Uh, what I would say to that question is, um, we would generally expect instruments to be come back for calibration on a yearly basis. That is to say that we take all the precautions to ensure that our probes are fit for the for the purposes that um, that that they're going to be used for. So if a probe has gone, if basically if the probe has worn after one use, then we really need to we really need to talk about some form of training or a or a motorized stand, for example, to eliminate this sort of heavy-handed use, because the the materials used in the probe tips themselves are actually quite hard wearing. Uh, in some cases, they are metal; in others, they're chrome. Uh, but while as in others, they're really tough plastics. So there really isn't um, there really isn't a expectation for a probe to go uh, to be to become worn, let's say, uh, after just one use. And how to measure metallic flake, metallic paint on aluminium car bodies? Ooh, that is a tricky question. Um, there is a way to do it, to be perfectly honest with you. And I would suggest that you uh, look into our um, micro hardness range of uh, instruments. We also do a range of instruments that basically are able to tell you the different hardness properties of the materials. But if there is inclusions uh, in within your paint, what you can do is you can actually get around these by doing the hardness measurements. Uh, we can we can talk about we can talk about let's say if a, if the coating itself is I don't know 30 microns for uh, argument's sake. What we do is we actually indent the uh, indent the paint by only 10% of the full thickness, so only by three microns. And from this, we can actually calculate not only the hardness. But there is a point that once you go beyond uh, beyond a certain uh, range, which in most cases tends to be about 10%, so three microns in this case, uh, there is a jump in the hardness, which then becomes the uh, the influence of the substrate material itself. So there is a way around it, uh, but we we would we would need to approach that, uh, that, let's say, project on an individual basis. OK. Um, I think somebody else is typing. Wayne is typing. Well. Yeah, Wayne is typing. Um, oh, Wayne's gone away. So um, right, just, just to let you know that if, um, can you just click that off? Just to let you know that um, we're hoping to do another webinar, possibly early in the new year. Um, I'm looking at the possibility of one called ISO 45001, which is a new ISO that is coming out. It's all to do with health and safety in the workplace from the top man down to the bottom man. Um, we gave this presentation in the southern branch of the IMF uh, a few weeks ago. Um, it does tend to be a, a sort of presentation that's lots of facts and figures, but I think it's one way by using the IMF and the webinar that we can perhaps get out 
a lot of the updated information on these ISO 45001, which probably a lot of people haven't read or don't even know about, but apparently it is coming into force, I believe, somewhere around 2020. Um, but um, hopefully that will be our next presentation. I will let you know as soon as possible. Um, but if there is any other calls, um, yes, we've got one that says, how can you affect the thickness of plating or paint on threads if the probe is too large? Over to you, Ken. Um, generally, uh, the plating on threads is a little bit more difficult to, to do. Obviously, as you, uh, as you say, the probe is too large. Um, however, what we can do is sort of get the average thickness across the, across the thread. By using uh, by using a larger probe, what we can uh, what we can say is um, we can sort of get the average average thickness. It's not necessarily a foolproof way of uh, figuring out what the thickness is, but uh, I would I would suggest that uh, if you have a specific sample uh, in mind that. If you if you are happy to send one sample down to us, we'd be happy to take a look into it and advise you on what the best way to to measure it is. Well, I think that's where we are. I hope you have actually enjoyed the first webinar. It seems to have gone off reasonably successfully. Um, mm -hmm. I seem to have pressed all the right buttons. I hope I have. Um, so looking forward to the next one. I will keep you posted. Um, please find us on LinkedIn um, because that's where I normally post all the new information. Uh, if you aren't on LinkedIn, just look for my name and it will also link it through to the IMF as well. So can I thank everybody who has attended? That was very kind of you on our first trial. I know it's a bit early, but I hope you all have a good Christmas and a good break from work. And hopefully we will see you in the new year. Thank you very much and goodbye.